Hi, everybody. John Malanka here with United Patients Group. Be informed and be well. The topic, taboo for many, not for, not for all, but the topic is uh, sex and cannabis. Uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, we covered a lot of ground. We've had a lot of feedback. And if you do have questions or any, any comments, please leave them in the thread below. We'd love to see them. And if you have any topics you want us to cover, this is what we're here for. Uh, the topic of sex and cannabis has come up so many times that we went out and found an expert and I think you'll enjoy this. So I uh, appreciate you, your support over the years for United Patients Group and what we're doing here. Enjoy the show. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. John Malanka with United Patients Group. Be informed and be well. This segment is brought to you by Aspen Green. Aspen Green is just a handful of USDA certified organic hemp and CBD brands. And all of this hemp is grown from the perfect topography and climate found in Colorado. Check out why purity matters at aspengreen.com and follow them on social channels at Aspen Green CBD. Use promo code UPGCBD for 20% off. Hey everybody, John Malanka here with the United Patients Group. Be informed and be well. Uh, pleasure to have a wonderful guest, Chelsea Sabara, on with us tonight. And uh, Chelsea, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. So this is a topic, well, first off, we haven't done a Facebook Live Q&A on, on United Patient Group in a long time. So we've been doing the podcast, uh, we've been doing shows, but we haven't done this. And so uh, a lot of our followers is, have, have uh, come, come to us and said, hey, guys, when are you going to do a Facebook Live? So why not break the ice with uh, a topic that's kind of taboo to some, and I'll get into that shortly. Uh, and I'm not talking to cannabis, I'm talking about sex. And so uh, Chelsea Sabar, she's been helping humans, and I love that, effectively and mindfully combine sex and cannabis since 2010 as a professional sex educator, product developer, and medically certified cannabis consultant. She is proud to develop the first uh, water-based uh, uh, barrier-compatible THC lubricant. We'll get into that too. Uh, Velvet Swing, Ms. Sabara, has been featured in numerous publications such as Forbes, Cosmopolitan, and Dope Magazine, and was named one of uh, MJ Ventures' top 40 under 40 in 2018, and has been featured speaker at prominent industry conferences such as Women Grow. She recently founded Sabara Consulting, continues to teach her high-demand sex and cannabis workshops, and speaks nationally on the intersection of cannabis with sex, kink, and consent culture. So welcome, Chelsea. Thanks for being on. Thank you. Thanks so much for uh, going through that. The bio. We're breaking the ice yeah. here. And so yeah. um, everybody, um, thank you for joining us tonight. And if you have questions, submit them. We've had quite a few that have submitted these questions uh, to us. And so I'll read those as, as we go on as well. Um, first off, before we get, before we start, there's two things I was telling Chelsea off, off camera is that pretty exciting. We've had uh, many newsletter signups when I posted our newsletter, and we had one of the, <laughs> probably the most unsubscribes uh, as well. And uh, we, I'm assuming because of the topic. And I did receive a couple emails from people saying, why are, why are you covering this topic? It's not uh, relevant to me. And so back to the relevant part, <clears throat> you know, United Page Group is a safe place that we built um, uh, that you can come and ask questions, listen, learn. Um, cancer is not relevant. I hope it's not rele relevant to anyone. And I certainly hope pain is not relevant to anyone. Uh, bipolar, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and so not everything we just discuss here is relevant for everyone. Um, and, but if we can help one person, and that's the way, you know, I've always looked at it, Kurt and I have always looked at it. If we can help one person, then we know it was a successful, successful meeting. And so that's why we wanted, uh, I asked Chelsea to be on. Um, she's an expert in, in this field. Uh, but also you, the listeners, have, have responded, reached out to us and said, you know, here are topics we'd like you to cover. And a lot of them we have. And so uh, we've done it on our, on, our, on our website, United Pace Group. We've done it here on, on Facebook and other social media channels, as well as our podcast. And so uh, that's why we have Chelsea on. So uh, Chelsea, thanks for being on. And uh, uh, you were saying blushing about your, your intro there, but- uh, well, I'm know. not blushing about the, the sexuality stuff. I'm blushing about the tooting my own horn. Kind oh, of. tooting your horn? Well, I'll, I'll, no, let, you, I'll, I'll let you, I'll, I'll toot your own, ho toot your own <laughs> horn there as well. Yeah. So um, let's go with some questions here. And I have two things, open. I have my uh, iPad and, and um, 
my, my laptop here. Um, Chelsea, what you do, can you share what you do on a daily basis and what uh, brought you into this industry um, as a professional sex educator? You've been doing this since 2010. Is this yeah. what your, your lifelong goal uh, was and has been? No, no. Um, my story is uh, pretty similar to a lot of folks who um, struggled with a condition themselves and found that cannabis was the only thing that worked. Uh, in my case, it was endometriosis. And I, uh, at the time, had uh, I graduated college in 2005. Excuse me, 2009. Sorry, I moved in 2005. Um, and uh, I... Had, I was on track, I always wanted to do human sexuality, um, kind of to your point about uh, the relevance or the applicability of sex to people's lives. Um, I, I would say, I mean, it's really one of the most broadly relevant things that you might talk about. Because even if you are someone who is asexual, you're living in a context in which sex pervades almost everything that we do. So even a, a lack of desire to engage uh, sexually is, is still uh, something that, that is really relevant to people's lives. So that universality uh, became uh, really interesting to me in the different ways that we manifest this kind of universal desire and the strange rules that we put around it. So I had, I had gone to college um, uh, for anthropology and was uh, focusing on sexual health and was planning on, on doing that. And I had struggled with endometriosis for a long time and I had been prescribed painkillers, muscle relaxants, every manner of prescription thing and nothing ever actually helped. It, it was just nightmarish. Um, once a month, I just had crippling pain and nothing to really do but endure it. Uh, and then I was uh, at a friend's house and had one of these attacks and she said, do a couple bong rips. And I'm from Florida where the weed is garbage. It is not high quality stuff. So my associations with cannabis were pretty negative. It was kind of this like, you know, really heavy, stony, pesticide ridden stuff. And so I was like, oh, I don't know if I want that, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm desperate. I'm in a lot of pain. And so I did. And not only um, did it handle it, it, the pain was gone, John, the pain was gone in 10 minutes. It was gone. And I didn't even feel intoxicated. I didn't even feel high. I was just healed. And it set me on this course where I really wanted to get involved with um, learning and talking to people about this plant. And I needed a job anyway, because when you're, you know, starting out in the sex ed world, it's like, you're not making a lot of money. Uh, so I was kind of, you know, doing this gig thing. And I had a part-time job at my friend's, uh, the, the same friend that offered me the bonk. I had a part-time job at her, at her uh, new medical dispensary that she had opened up in 2011. And it all kind of took off from there. I, I was working there and I was seeing products that were designed for sexuality that were really poorly formulated. Um, a lot of them had things that are really bad for the vaginal biome. They had uh, things that were not optimized in any number of ways. And so I'm sitting here going, well, there's all these people who know so much about weed and all these people who know so much about sex, but like, no, but they're not talking to each other and they're making products and things like that. And so that's kind of how I started teaching the workshop and uh, everything grew from there. The, the light bulb came on and the niche was formed, huh? Yeah, yeah, and uh, independently of me, there's been a few other people who landed yeah. in this niche, and we generally we know each other and we work together and try to support each other. Uh, yeah, I've seen, I've, I've seen a couple of your panels on here too. Um, yeah. So Bob, I'm not I'm going to call you out because you're putting here, but Bob is saying, "Hey, John, my wife and I made a date night out of watching your program the other evening. We had a blast. I'm assuming that they're watching this tonight to, to have a date night. Can we talk about how important this is?" Uh, uh, having, having connection with you, with your, I'll say mate, if you want to say mate, partner, spouse. Um, and sometimes, and this comes in all the time here and I'll go right into the first question. You know, how can my partner and I keep up the energy, uh, year after year after being in a long-term relationship? Can you talk about the importance of connection with couples? Uh, yeah. I know that you work with a lot of couples one-on-one. -on -one, um, and so can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is 
something that, that, that used to get thrown around, particularly in the 80s and 90s, as a, a solution for things getting kind of routine, right, uh, was to introduce novelty. And yeah. they would talk about uh, bring a new toy or new lingerie or, uh, you know, go somewhere new or something like that. And that's all great stuff, but it's kind of oblique to the actual issue, which is not so much that we get tired of the circumstances, but that we lose that spark, that admiration that we, we used to have in uh, the limerence phase of our early relationship for our partner. Um, so a, a great way that I like to advise people to keep things alive is not only the introduction of novelty, but you wanna find contexts where you can see your partner being awesome, whatever that is. Um, my partner plays a lot of D&D. &D. Um, I play too, but not as much as he does. <laughs> but he is an amazing dungeon master. He's really, really good and really gets into it and has these highly developed political contexts, right? Find ways to see your partner in their element being really good at something, whether it's something you do or not, something that they shine at. And this gives you this kind of, this spark that you used to have, be like, wow, I'm with somebody really cool, <laughs> right? Um, and, and that can really reignite that kind of passionate, that those limerence feelings that you have. And similarly, um, if you wanna find an opportunity or a way to in involve that kind of feeling in your date nights, in your solo and connected times, yeah. um, then that's a great way to do it. And, and the introduction of novelty can also be a part of that if your partner has something that they're particularly keen on that they want to share with you. Um, and of course, you know, all the stuff we talked about on the, the podcast. podcast. Yeah. 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 So, Trust so everyone, if you, if you haven't uh, checked out the podcast, Chelsea and I did a podcast uh, that aired, I want to say last week, and you can still find it on United Case Group dot com podcast uh, section there as well as well as the all, the all of the other guests that we've had on there too um and actually chelsea with this too i've had more people contact me today with this newsletter that went out and said how can i be on how can i be a, a guest on the show so thank you for uh uh putting that spark out there and leading into the spark this question may might have come from the same person how can we keep the spark going with the ability to fan it into a flame at our discretion uh, say that say that again so leading in, you were talking about the, the spark about how can my partner keep up the energy year after year. And the same uh, question came in from the same person. And also, how can we keep that spark going with the ability to fan it into a flame um, <laughs> at our dis discretion, too? And so uh, uh, so like Bob with, with his wife on date night. And so I yeah. applaud you, Bob, yeah. Bob for, for, for uh, having a date. Date nights are so important. And I, and I hope everyone out there... Uh, realizes that. Um, yeah. So anyway, talking about talking about keeping the spark going. Yeah, um, that that is something that um, there's kind of a counterintuitive approach that you might take, which is stop trying so hard, take the pressure off and think about everything around the connection, the circumstance and and let you want to kind of let that connection happen organically because nothing is worse for developing and cultivating passion than feeling like you have to, right? Performance anxiety is not just for the bedroom. It also is for all of your romantic connections. I mean, you don't wanna, f it, 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 it kills it. Um, so first of all, think about anything that might be getting in the way, much like cannabis itself is not an aphrodisiac, but it does remove the barriers to your own eroticism. You might wanna think about how that applies to everything else. So if you're if you're tired and you you're worn out and there's too many responsibilities and you're focused on the practicalities of life, you're not focusing on each other and that that precious unique connection that you have. So pay someone to clean the house, you know, go go somewhere, take relieve that. If you have access to childcare safely in these times, use it. Um, and you may want to consider. Um, the sort of, I, I hesitate to say tantric because um, there, there's been a lot of dilution of that term and I, I don't wanna represent uh, myself as a tantra you know, person, but the, the approach of taking a very long, very slow uh, process of connecting with each other, appreciating each other, your bodies and your energy 
before or even in lieu of thinking about sexuality, um, sexuality will happen. Your, your, your sexual connection will happen when you give it the space to happen. When you remove the barriers of stress, pressure and shame. And if you've been in a relationship for a long time, you're, you're probably dealing with less shame-based stuff, you know? Um, but, but if you have any of that uh, hanging around, give yourself and your partner uh, the gift of forgiveness for any judgment you might have for their, their fantasies or anything like that and, and create a space that is shame-free. I, I, I think it's important to uh, realize everyone's under pressure nowadays. You know, uh, if you, you and I were talking about, you know, uh, you having your young one at home mm -hmm. or no, actually your, ch your child's going to school, but they're not really having the interaction that they're normally having at school because they're in pods, they have masks, they go every other day. Um, you know, I'm not a parent, I'm not a single parent. You know, I have friends that are single parents and they're, they're trying to juggle all the kids and, and making sure they're in school, making sure they're uh, uh, listening to the teacher, doing the homework, et cetera, et cetera. And so stress uh, adds into that as well. Um, people use, uh, uh, here's a question here. Sec Hi, I use sex as a treatment for anxiety uh, as well as depression, as well as daily stress. Is this normal? Uh, and can I have, what, what discussions can I have with my partner? Uh, did you, they use sex as a treatment or they use cannabis sex, as a treatment? Me, well, they're saying sex. So maybe sex is a treatment for anxiety. How about sex and cannabis for, for a treatment? Well, let's go with sex as a treatment for anxiety. A lot of people like feel that the only way they can get that relief of the daily stress and forget everything is, is uh, to have sex. Yeah. Well, I, honestly, my response to that is high five. Good. <laughs> You found something that works for you and something that's difficult to access for a lot of people. Struggling with anxiety uh, usually is, uh, in, it usually inhibits uh, libido and sexuality and the ability to connect. So you, you've won uh, in, that, in that case. The only time that it ever, and this is whether it's sex or cannabis or anything like that, um, I, I believe very deeply, the only time that it ever becomes problematic is if it's a problem for you. Uh, if it's causing problems in your life, uh, then it's something that needs to be addressed. But anything else, literally any drug you might be using, anything else that you're doing, if it's not causing problems, you don't have any problems, you know? And that's, um, that's uh, an important thing to think about when we're trying to deprogram ourselves and how we think about, you know, what a drug is, you know, in a, in a country where we all wake up and drink a cup of speed first thing in the morning. Um, cup of speed. It, which caffeine is more addictive than cannabis. The topic always comes up. We've had other people on the show and they say, you know, is cannabis addictive? Well, coffee's addictive. Sugar's high, high, has higher addiction rate than cannabis. And so uh, mm -hmm. I think it's habit forming. I don't know if it's addictive. Um, and we are talking about using it as an escape here too. And I'm going right down the list of questions that have been submitted to us as well as people that are uh, writing in. So if anybody wants to submit questions, please, please uh, do it right here. Um, uh, and I'll, and I'll ask them, uh, to Chelsea live on, live on the show here. Uh, next question here, Chelsea, um, I'm using sex as an escape rather than a journey. Does that mean I'm running away from something? That is not something that I can answer for you in this forum. Okay. Um, it is, it, it, it depends. Sex does not have to be, I'll speak generally. Um, sex does not have to be a big sacred thing, you know? Um, it, it can be anything that the people involved determine it to be. It can be casual, it can be transactional, it can be deep and, and meaningful and life-changing. Uh, it can be perfunctory. It can, it, there's not anything that it can be, um, it is all, it's all determined by the people involved. So if you're feeling like you want something more or different, uh, then, then that, that is a call. That's a, you know, a, a, a bit of a, a, a flag for you from your own consciousness to, to say that something's unsatisfactory and that's, and that's deep work. You know, you got to sit down and you got to get into that in therapy and you have to figure out, um, what, what's actually going on there and what you're not getting out of the way that you're approaching it. Uh, but you have to just ask yourself the question, is this actually something that is troubling me 
or is it something that I think should be troubling me? And our society teaches us uh, that we should be bothered by any number of things. We should be bothered by non-monogamy. We should be bothered by our partner looking at porn. We should be bothered, you know, we should be offended by all of these things. And I, I meet so many people who just actually aren't. They just think they're supposed to be. And you're like, you dig down and you can kind of be like, well, what's, what's actually troubling you? And they're not actually troubled. So, so doing that, that work of uh, say, you know, is this, is this normative society speaking or is this actually something that I feel is lacking and that needs to change? And if it is, then you go in and you do the work. Why is the topic, topic of sex so taboo? Wow. <laughs> have to have a show. I mean, it just seems like it, it's a topic yeah. that, you know, people don't want to talk about cannabis and tr tr people don't want to talk about sex. And it's yeah. always a hush hush thing. And now we're combining it. And that's what I was talking at the beginning of the show is that we had more unsubscribes in the newsletter and, and, uh, and then people wrote in as well. And so I just said, Hey, you know what? It, it, it may not, uh, uh, be relevant for you, but it is relevant for others. And so, uh, so thank you for our listeners that are on right here. And thank you for the people that stayed on our newsletter and didn't unsubscribe. <laughs> I mean, we never want to offend anybody. I mean, these topics come up, these topics come in to myself all the time, you know, I patient group, I'm, they come into Chelsea on a regular basis. And so that's why we, we brought this here as well. Um, and I'm going to go right down the list that were submitted, the questions that were submitted here as well. Um, does cannabis, and I want to talk about the consent thing. And I know we spoke about this in, in yeah. our podcast, in our podcast and that, that uh, we had a lot of people that wrote in about, about the consent. Thank you to talk about that um, just because of the, what's happening in our society right now. Um, but uh, can cannabis uh, enhance sexual pleasure? Uh, yes, the 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 very in contrast where the the big question of why is sex taboo? I mean, I guess that's got a short answer too. It's just simply control, right? Yeah. It's simply control. It's it's a, a way to control people, and uh, not all control is bad, but um, the there definitely is a social need to modify the behavior of other people, and. Uh, from my schooling in anthropology, I can tell you that the most effective way to uh, control people and to influence their behavior is to weaponize shame. And so they've been very, very effective at uh, creating taboos around sexuality, which is really bizarre considering how, how universal it is in, and central in many people's lives. But... <laughs> Well, it's funny because I never had this, the sex talk in our house. You know, we didn't, I didn't talk about cannabis in the house. It was something that we didn't talk about. I grew up overseas. So I missed the whole uh, sex ed class. I came back here for high school and all my buddies, I said, well, we didn't have the sex talk. And I said, I can't, have, you know, and, I, and, and nowadays, and I we shared this on the podcast, I applaud uh, my, my friends who have kids and they can have the talk about cannabis and drugs with their, with their children. Uh, maybe partake with their kids, but also have the talk about sex with their kids and, and not make it so taboo. I think this conversation um, with family members, uh, I think it brings the family closer together, yeah. you know, and so it's not, it's not one talk either. It should not be like this one pressury, heavy yeah. thing where you sit down and you try to explain the birds and the bees all at once. Or they walk uh, in your room. It's like, son, I want to I have a I, let's have this conversation here. Like, oh. <laughs> right. It's, that, it's, it's very strange and it, and it conveys and your actions all the rest of the time convey to your kid, this is something dark and dirty and shameful um, when it's not actually yeah. at all. Um, you know, you can play around with those ideas, um, but there is little else that is as, as pure as a desire to connect with another human being. And sex is one of the ways that we do that. And it's extraordinarily natural. Um, so the, uh, the, 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 the idea is that you just kind of normalize the, the presence of, of sexuality, like it exists. Now there's a, there's a difference between acknowledging the sexuality of, you know, kids or of, you know, like your, your, your peers and anything like that. We all have asexuality, right? Even very young children have this kind of amorphous, uh, you know, they, they have a, 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 a sensual urge, right? But that is very different from sexualizing, which we don't want to do in any of these contexts, right? And I think a lot of people see those as the same thing. 
uh, that you can't, can't talk about sex without sexualizing. And I think it's really important. A lot of my work is, is I, I want as much as possible activist wise to, to break those two ideas apart. We can discuss and acknowledge the sexuality of something without making that person an object of our own sexual desire. And I deal with this, unfortunately, constantly um, as a female bodied person in my, you know, a female presenting person, sorry, in my, um, in my workshops and stuff like that. You know, I, I talk frankly about sex and then you get a lot of people who, well, well this, the presumption is that I'm, I'm opening myself up for, for sexual advances. It's like, no, these are two different things. One is discussion of sex. The other one is creating the, the objectification, the sexualization of the person that is speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we could separate those two ideas, we would have a way less weird time, basically. Um, and, and we could speak about things, frankly, without feeling like we were being inappropriate, you know, right? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Um, um, but you had another, your question was, the, the question that is, can cannabis enhance sex? And that's an easy one to answer. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that, that was like your earlier, high, your earlier answer. That's a high five. Yeah, that, that's an easy one. I mean, if you want to talk about the mechanisms by which it does so, the theory behind it and things like that, we can get into more detail. But the, the, the take home is um, we have a sad state of scientific research on the intersection of cannabis and sex. Uh, that is not surprising considering the dual stigmatization of these two topics. However, we do have some research and more importantly, we have thousands and thousands of years of records of, being, uh, of cannabis being used effectively to enhance sexuality. And that is, you know, at this point, um, this, the sheer weight of that evidence is irrefutable. Um, even in the face of, you know, scientific rigor, it's just, it, it, it's just that it does, it does enhance this. And, and it, the devil is always in the details, of course. You can't take too much, you can't take the wrong thing. It's not a blanket always 100% of the time, but the mechanism is there for it to enhance sexual pleasure. Yes, absolutely. Well, th th that goes in the next way. Why would someone want to use cannabis to enhance sex? And I, Why? I well, <laughs> because uh, there's there's a number of things, and and this may actually speak a little bit more to the relevance to okay. your group because I know you deal uh, with medical patients a lot, and a lot of your your audience is that um, the the effect of various uh, disease states on your sexuality is something that isn't talked about a lot because we tend to, especially in the medical sphere, tend to dismiss sexuality as this kind of optional part of life, right? Which is deeply untrue for a lot of people. It's, it's very important to a lot of people, to most people, right? And because of that stigma, you, you know, maybe you don't want to bring this up with your doctor. I, I advise doctors often because they don't know how to talk about these things, right? With either cannabis or sex with patients. I'll, I'll talk to doctors about this to help them speak uh, more, uh, at least more relaxed and, and more accurately about, about cannabis at least. Um, so there are a lot of conditions that can cause sexual dysfunction and some treatments like chemo, for example, right, um, can, can exacerbate sexual dysfunction. And the, um, the reasons that a medical cannabis patient might use uh, a product or, or uh, a strain to, to balance out or address that dysfunction um, are legion. There's a lot of, a lot of you know, whatever you're, you're going through, chances are if it's your standard sexual dysfunction array, you know, which is like lack of desire, um, you have, you know, uh, pain with intercourse, you have lack of lubrication, you have um, erectile dysfunction, um, you know, this kind of standard suite of things. Cannabis is moderately helpful for some of them and extraordinarily helpful for others like post or perimenopausal anorgasmia, um, you have, uh, cannabis can be a, a revolution for that, 
if, if you're struggling to find orgasm and that's a change from how you were uh, prior to the start of menopause, cannabis can, can address that in, in tremendous ways. Um, less effective for ED, less effective for desire, libido issues itself, but again, it can help kind of remove those barriers to your own libido flourishing. It, it, it's funny that that question came in here. Hey, hi guys, the physical cues for male sexu sexual dysfunction can be obvious as you're talking about erectile dysfunction, but not so much for women. Are most women aware that they may be suffering from sexual dysfunction or is it harder to spot? I think that most women, um, and the, the number, uh, well, the, there's been a, a number of different studies, but solidly a majority of women experiences uh, sexual dysfunction over the course of their lifetime. And that's a bummer. Yeah. Um, a lot of times not knowing our bodies and not being told to, taught to explore our bodies, uh, we come to that realization later that we're struggling, that there's this orgasm thing that happens for some people, but we've never felt it, you know, and you're in your mid twenties or something like that. Um, so I, I think that when, I, I think that women are very aware, um, who are, who are existing in kind of the popular culture, uh, they are aware if they, they are feeling, uh, like they're, there's something they're missing out on, you know, um, lubrication is not a great indicator of arousal. Uh, there's a common misconception about that lubrication is really, really hit or miss. So don't take that as a, a gauge of whether somebody is turned on. Um, but, uh, but the uh, erectile tissue that is present in the penis is uh, specifically in the glands, the, the tip of the penis is analogous to the portion of the clitoris that is exterior. So that's the same tissue, right? It's just been modified based on, you know, the developmental cues, your genetic cues while you're in the womb. Um, but it reacts pretty much the same way. And so you can, uh, you can kind of sense, <laughs> you can feel uh, if there's a response there. And I think there's enough now, and uh, while it's pop culture and it's like kind of bad info, there's enough open discussion of sexuality that I think most women, if they, if they are, you know, engaging with that at all, they're going, there might be something missing there. And, and unfortunately for a lot of us, it takes time to discover that be in your power enough yeah. where you want to say, I want to change that. So how much is physical over psychological then that you're seeing in your, with your clients? Oh, with my clients in, yeah. a, in a, just a general sense, yeah. um, I would say for, for, I mean, and this holds true in research uh, that the psychological aspects are definitely bigger for yeah. uh, female identified persons. Yeah. Um, there's more brain stuff that's happening. Uh, yeah. It, you know, this is a topic that come, this question comes into us uh, more than any other. And so um, about sexual dis dysfunction and, and um, uh, this question, for example, what can I do as a lover when I discover my partner suffers from sexual dis dis dysfunction? Uh, it's, it's, you know, I don't want to make them embarrassed. And so yeah. can you share, um, you know, I think we talked about this on our podcast the other day, uh, massage and, and making the, the other, uh, making the connection. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it depends on the type of dysfunction, you yeah. know, and, and the root cause of that. Um, ED can have physical as well as psychological causes. Uh, the same is true for, you know, female sexual dysfunction. Yeah. But um, if you're dealing with something like vaginismus, which is an unconscious tightening uh, of the pelvic floor muscles that often accompanies PTSD, um, the, the solution to that is, uh, is to heal this, to address the PTSD you know, rather than to think about it as a, a sex thing, you know, there's, there's all kinds of issues and they may have come from a, a sexual circumstance or a sexual assault, but that is, you know, it's not what we would really call sexual dysfunction necessarily because it's, it's this much bigger suite of, of, uh, of issues. So some of it does depend on you know, where it's coming from, what, what body parts we're, we're talking about here. Uh, but always as a partner, your job is to be supportive and not pressury. Um, extend an invitation 
put things as fun. There's something that you want to try. And for the love of God, stop thinking about penetrative sex as the only option. <laughs> um, We're there, males. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> there are this and but uh, kind of um, maybe contrary to what you might think, taking the focus off of penetrative sex in a hetero couple um, can actually get you to the penetrative, penetrative sex because it's confidence building to engage in other ways. Decide that you're gonna have a non-goal oriented masturbation session or uh, just you know an oral session or something like that where you're not gonna worry about people are getting off. You're not gonna check if people are getting off. If it, ha if it happens, great. But your goal is solely to experience pleasure together and build that trust and connection and confidence. And uh, if you continue to do that and you just take that, you know, think about all the different things that count for sex. I mean, it's only, you know, what is it? 20% of um, vagina owners can orgasm from pen penetration alone. Did you say vagina owners? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was in possession of a I've never, I've never, <laughs> vagina havers vagina vagina owner. havers vagina owners i like it i like yeah. it and only 20 percent can yeah it's very very it's very um i should be uh, man i when i teach i have these earrings that have a yeah. diagram of the anatomical clitoris that i use to to show i should have been wearing those uh but uh so the the clitoris is a massive structure you want to talk about tip of the iceberg right um the part that we, you know, the little, the little man in the boat, the part that is exterior is very small, right? And what a lot of people don't know is that the interior clitoris is enormous. It hugs the vagina and stretches up in two tendrils inside the, the pelvis. So you are getting sensation from the clitoris even when you're having vaginal sex. There's all kinds of things going on there. Um, so there's this huge potential to access all of this, this stuff, but really the, ma the majority of people who have vaginas are, uh, are going to need focused, intense stimulation, and I hesitate to say the word intense, but focused stimulation of the clitoris and the surrounding area in order to reach orgasm. And we need to accept that as a biological reality and have fun with it because it's not actually a bummer what it is is a, a an opening of the gates of opportunity to do things that are more wild and interesting i think that leads us to the next thing about communication you know share with your partner what, you, what you're into you know this feel good that feel good no yes no um we had our uh, you want to go into the consent thing now or you want to sure. hold off yeah, on that always. i know i, I know that was a topic we had a lot of people that wrote in and said you know, thanks for covering covering that part of it because um, I don't want to. You know, drugs and sex is a is a, is a uh, uh, touchy subject, and so yeah. can you talk about the the consent portion? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, I'm very uh, upfront about this. I, I myself am a, a rape survivor, um, and uh, I I've experienced plenty of consensual sexual situations and a, a few not consensual ones. Um, and uh, that plus my, my training is, is really kind of given me a, a pretty strong ethos around all of this stuff. And I'm really happy to see the national conversation that we're having around what meaningful consent means, not just is she saying yes, but does she mean yes, right? And all the complex things that go into whether someone decides to have sex, right? Um, I loved the conversation about enthusiastic consent and I loved even more the conversation that followed that said, wait a second, my consent doesn't have to be enthusiastic. It just has to be present. If my consent is there, it's enough, right? Sometimes you love your partner, you're not as much in the mood, they're really in the mood, you can toss someone, it's okay. You don't actually have to, you know, be like, there's not pressure to be that enthusiastic, but it does have to be present. And especially in the context of intoxicated sex, it gets dicey really quick. Unfortunately, the legal drug, alcohol, is one of the worst mm -hmm. for muddying consent boundaries. 
Um, it's, it's, I think, I mean, I, I think alcohol is among the worst drugs, full stop. I think it's a terrible drug. Um, but it, it has a, a pretty profound effect on, on people's decision making in a way that is not mirrored in cannabis. Cannabis tends to have a more gradual, more diffuse uh, effect that uh, makes it a little bit easier to, to gauge, you know, where you're at and where your partner is at in terms of their ability. Uh, you know, you don't really tend to go into a cannabis blackout unless you've had way, way, way too much edibles, right? Um, so when it, when it comes to setting up, um, and again, you can use lubes to not be intoxicated and still get the, the, physiological benefits of cannabis, but let's say that you are interested in that intoxication and you want to have intoxicated sex. Um, the first thing that you want to do is establish as much intentionality around the experience as possible. Um, you're accepting a certain level of risk. You are not living in a world where there's like, there's consent and there's no consent. You know, you're living in a world where there's a potential for some uh, non-consensual activity to happen and for communication on that to be delayed, right? Hopefully you have a partner with whom if this started to happen, you could quickly right the ship. You could quickly fix that problem. Um, but what you're gonna do is, is talk with them about how you would right the ship if that were to happen. Um, be very intentional about your goals, what you're gonna, what you're gonna take and how you're going to do it. Or you can even, you know, if this is, you got, you've been living together for 10 years, you'd be like, Hey, I had a couple hits. Hope that's cool. <laughs> um, and, and you know, each other pretty well. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, there isn't any risk of consent violations. That's actually something that is important to talk about because people who have been engaging with each other sexually for decades um, can still, and in some ways are more likely to have consent violations because they take things for granted. And that's why I harp on the intentionality aspect of uh, really doing whatever you're gonna do on purpose. On the podcast, we talked about the yes, no, maybe list, which is uh, a great tool for doing that. Um, attention is your greatest you can, ally. For those of you who have, who have not listened to the podcast, um, you want you want to go over that? Uh, oh yeah, real quick. Talking? This is uh, this is a this can be a fun exercise, especially uh, yeah. if like that but that one person uh, has been in a relationship for a long time and wants yeah. to spice things up. This can be a fun activity. You can tell them Chelsea told you to do it. It's not you. You you had this. Yeah, I'm blaming on Chelsea. Uh, <laughs> who told you to do this? So. Um, what a yes, no, maybe list is, is literally a list of pretty much like all the sex acts you can think of. What is it possible to do sexually exhaustively? Now you can do this yourself or you can go online and you can download. A lot of these exist, so you can download these. And for each activity, the idea is that you would say that you're a yes to this activity. You've tried it and you love it. You're a maybe. Either you haven't tried it, or you've tried it and you're not sure, or you want to try it on a cert under certain circumstances, or a no, right? You're not going to be doing that ever, right? This has the effect of outsourcing responsibility for bringing up your desires. So if you're sitting down with your partner, you don't have to broach the topic of bondage and say, I'm interested in bondage. You have a piece of paper that is the actor here. So you can go oh, I see bondage is on the list. Well, I'm a maybe on that, you know? And it allows you to kind of not have to have that, that uncomfortable bringing it up. And you can have, you know, a joint or a glass of wine or something and make a fun activity out of this um, and, uh, and kind of get to know each other a little bit better because I guarantee you, if you've been in a relationship for a long time, there are things your partner is into that you don't know about. And it's an opportunity for you to find new areas to explore together. Um, and if you're brand new, this is something definitely in the kink community that uh, is kind of a, because if you're going to play on those fringes, right, then you want to be really, really intentional about what you're doing. So this practice kind of originated there. And uh, with new partners, I would love to see normative partners incorporate this as a standard practice with uh, with new sexual partners, like, what are we into? What are we gonna do? This is something that the sex positive people do all the time, having conversations about the sex they're gonna have later. 
but I feel like in the the muggle world, as we call it, the the, the you, say the, you say the muzzle world, the muggle world. Oh, okay. The 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 non magic people, the the okay. uh, the people that don't live in the the sex positive bubble. Um, I feel like that's that's really rare. Yeah. To have that conversation about what kind of sex you're going to have. That there's this expectation that it's just going to magically line up. And that's not only bad for the sex that you're going to have, but it also is bad for the consent angle. I mean, you're, you're going to more struggle to understand each other's signals uh, if you haven't talked about what those signals are. And blame it on Chelsea. Chelsea Chelsea's list. Chelsea told you to, to do this. Yeah. I just thought it would be fun. Yeah, good. Um, you spoke about lube a couple of times and, and I want to, uh, can you share, you made a, uh, we talked about the with your company of w- what you're doing. And um, one, it's the first, is it not lubricated? That, that does, I mean, I, that, was the, that was new to me knowing that a lube could actually ruin uh, a condom. Meaning yeah. not ruin it, but-, but uh, uh, Disintegrate it. Weaken it, disintegrate it. Yeah, is, is what can actually happen. Yeah, so can you uh, talk about that? Yeah, this is an important safety element. And again, something that in the sex positive world, this is known, but uh, in people who don't- uh, well, What's the definition of sex positive? Oh, sex positive. Uh, well, there, there's probably a, a formal definition out there, but this is a, a movement that started in the 90s, um, late 80s, early 90s, uh-huh. about um, the idea that we regard sex as an inherently positive act, right? This is separate from the, the words non-consensual sex is not, that's not a thing. If it's non-consensual, it's not sex, right? Then we're talking about assault. So I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about any sex that is consensual has, is inherently positive, right? There are some people who take it a bit further and say that, that we don't need to be sex positive, that we should be sex neutral. Um, but I myself am a sex positive person. I, I think that um, it's an inherently positive act if you know if we're being consensual, consensual about it. The, the nature of it is inherently positive. Um, where, what was the thing before that though? I was supposed to be answering something else. Your lube. Lube, Your lube right, <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, so I'll just say this loud. Uh, Oil-based products, whether oils in general, whether they are cannabis infused or not, are not compatible with safer sex barriers, such as condoms, dams, and gloves. That includes latex, polyisoprene, and now polyurethane as well. We used to talk about polyurethane as uh, an, uh, an option, but Trojan, uh, Trojan Supra uh, has said that they do not repre- want to represent their Supras as compatible with oil-based products. So technically all of those. Lambskin is an interesting kind of one over here, like you have your general suite here and the, the lambskin uh, condom question is, uh, is pretty interesting in the like kind of how the, the discourse goes with harm reductionists versus, you know, like what are the risks that we're taking here? Um, but theoretically that would, they would be compatible with an oil-based lube. Um, so I just want to get that out there. Okay. Don't use oil with barriers. And, and do you want to give, give your, your company a plug on that? Oh, sure. Yeah. No, I'm, I have uh, amicably parted ways with Velvet Swing. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, but I still huge supporter of the brand. We're on great terms. Everything is fine. Um, they, uh, but it was me and my business partner, Mistress Matisse. She is a pretty well-known author and dominatrix. And we know each other from the sex positive circles, right? We, we both sex educators. We both talk on various topics. And um, she uh, reached out to me because she knew that I had been doing the sex and cannabis thing uh, about formulating a water-based uh, uh, variation on the cannabis lubes that she had been seeing. So oil-based lubes, uh, oil-based cannabis lubes are great and can be great for a number of reasons. Um, I recommend them to a lot of people, but they do have some drawbacks. That is specifically, they taste and smell like weed, they can stain, and they're not compatible with the safer sex barriers, right? 
So she wanted to fix this. And um, what ended up happening is uh, I formulated the uh, water-based emulsion-based uh, alternative that we, we called Velvet Swing. And that uh, we did a bunch of testing to determine is compatible with latex polyisoprene and polyurethane barriers, which is great. It's great to have as an option. And uh, the big thing to remember, whether it's water-based or whether it is um, oil, is that cannabis lubes are not actually lubes. They might feel luby, they may add some lubrication, but what they really are is topicals. And you want to give them time to absorb. So when you're using these, you want to put them on any densely vascularized area. Of course, that includes genitals, perineum, and, but it also includes areolas. Some people use it on the interior wrist or ankle, maybe even behind the ear. Um, anywhere that you want to heighten sensation, you want to give them enough time to soak in. So try to plan for 20 minutes to let that take effect. And I used to say in my workshops, surely you can think of something to do for 20 minutes, come on. <laughs> so encourage foreplay or put it on at the beginning of the night, put it on before you go to dinner because the effects last for a few hours. You might so be distracted at dinner. Yeah, I bet it will be a <laughs> go order, I guess, huh? Yeah. Um, Valerie has a question. Thank you, Bradley. Um, hi guys, what are the benefits for loving consensual adults? What are the benefits? Yeah, what are the benefits for loving using uh, cannabis? In, in, oh, in... For, for, for cannabis? Yeah. Oh, wow. So um, the, if you're going to have a, an intoxicated experience, you're going to have a systemic experience, you're going to get high. Um, the, the opportunities for that kind of expansive interplay between your, you and your partner or partners energetically is huge. Um, finding the, the right combination of cannabinoids and consumption method where you can connect with each other and be on the same wavelength, if I can get a little metaphysical. I am a scientist, but <laughs> um, it, this, this is just a, a, a wonderful way to, to open your hearts to each other and, and experience your sensuality and your sexuality in a unified and, and beautiful way. Um, Physiologically, the experience that you can expect is something called peripheral vasodilation, which means that the, uh, the extremities tend to flush with blood. So you'll have greater blood flow at the periphery of the body. And this is true for all over your body if you're doing systemic cannabis. If you're applying it topically, this is true locally in the genital area. And that enhanced blood flow is one of the fundamental building blocks to natural arousal. The physiological arousal response that cannabis can initiate can then begin a feedback cycle that gets your mental, you know, your, your libido on board basically. Um, and, uh, and it's really, it, <laughs> It's, it's kind of tempting to think of it as a little bit of a cheat code, um, but, but it really is a, a, an enhancement that can uh, bring um, more ready arousal and response, uh, regardless of what your anatomy is, and a, uh, what I like to call a symphonic um, interaction wow. between your systemic cannabis and, and your localized cannabis. And, and you, I really do feel like there's a lot in this analogy of like the vibrations that are, that are happening. Um, you know, I, it, I use it to, to describe how you, uh, how, how your, your body uh, resonates off of another human being. And how you, you and, and sex is very, very deeply intertwined in that. Um, so yeah, I, I think that it, it is not hyperbolic to say that cannabis is a, a revolutionary sexual aid and something that we're, we're only beginning to, to understand the potential of. My work has certainly shown that. Yeah. Um, what's, what's the history of sex and cannabis? I know we kind of talked about that, but that one comes up. It, it's been used for thousands of years. Thousands, thousands of years. Yeah. I was saying on the podcast, you know, um, it was, it was probably about five minutes after, uh, the discovery of 
cannabis that it was used sexually. <laughs> that's how that's how human beings t- tend to do. We 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 try it with sex right away. Um, so there are uh, records in uh, in Egypt and in uh, a little bit in China. Uh, there's a, a couple of Scandinavian references. And then of course, in the turn of the century uh, here in the United States, we have a lot of references to uh, gynecological concerns, whether it's pain with childbirth or various kinds of menstrual pain. And not a lot of things are written down about specifically enhancing sex. But one of the interesting things uh, that that I I mentioned on the podcast as well is that uh, there is uh, the suspicion that this ointment that was rubbed on the broomsticks of witches uh, was actually, uh, it included cannabis and that this was uh, a delivery method actually for for decreasing menstrual pain and various kinds of gynecological pain. I'm, I'm chuckling because I forgot about, we had a lot, we had a lot of people write in about that. The, 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 the yeah. Thing. And yeah. So, and uh, I don't, I mean, there's, it's all, you know, uh, it's, it's like informed conjecture. Right. But, but yeah. And then seasonal, right. Which is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We'll see them. We'll see. We'll see them uh, sa- Saturday, I guess, huh? Yes. Yes. <laughs> ha- happily flying on their broomsticks here too. So, uh, um, I want to talk about. Here's a question that's coming. Then I'll then I'll get into the next one here. This is from uh, Brandon. Hey, Brandon. Uh, do you believe THC or CBD or other cannabinoids are what heightens sensitivity for for the women in her vagina, and libido, clitoris, and in particular, what ingredients uh, do this as well? Uh, THC. Is, is really your powerhouse. Uh, we, we did go into some depth on the, in the podcast about how CBD is a helper cannabinoid. Um, it is really not suited for being used in isolation. So if you can get your hands on THC lube or THC products, you'll have a much better effect than if you go CBD only. And I know that's difficult with regulations, but that's just the reality of the matter. THC is a more potent vasodilator. It's going to be uh, where you, you really see your greatest results. There are other ways and other ingredients that can be included as part of a preparation. Uh, you can make cannabis lube at home on your stove, and you can add some of these other ingredients uh, and see if it works for you. I tend to try to keep it simple, uh, but the inclusion of kava uh, is, is a common one. Some people uh, will use either like there's there's been raspberry leaf that people have used various kinds of like cinnamon and things like that. And I think the inclusion of, of many of those more aromatic herbs uh, may be supportive, but it is also uh, introducing additional terpenes, which may help with the absorption. And um, kava is a little bit of a different thing. Kava is a, a kind of root. a- Is it a root? A kava kava? Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. I'm not, I'm not a huge herbalist. <laughs> I don't- that, That's the same kava you're talking about though? Yeah, yeah. It's the same mm. stuff that you can get out at health food stores. Yeah. Same deal. Yeah, um, that is helpful for stimulating blood flow and is often included in preparations with cannabis. Thank you. Yeah. Um, erectile dysfunction and, and mixing cannabis um, with uh, Viagra. You touched up on that and that, that topic came up quite a bit as well. And mm-hmm. uh, can you talk about that? Yes, um, CBD is enjoying this, uh, well, it's jumped the shark now a bit, but it, it's enjoying this popularity and people perceive it as completely harmless because it doesn't get you high in the way that they understand THC gets you high. Yeah. And that's really unfortunate <clears throat> because CBD uh, does have a number of potential drug interactions at high doses. If you're taking 10 milligrams of CBD, you don't really have to worry about that, you know? But if you're taking these high doses of CBD, actually trying to treat a condition with it, uh, you do not want to use uh, anything that would be counterindicated with grapefruit juice. So it's the same liver enzymes that kind of delay the processing of the cannabinoids and can increase, uh, excuse me, not, excuse me, not the cannabinoids, delay the processing of the medication that you're taking. Um, and can increase the duration and intensity of whatever it is. And Viagra is one of those drugs. So if you are taking high dose CBD, 
do not take Viagra or you're going to be more at risk of the infamous erection lasting four hours, which is more than four hours, which is, you know, in, we laugh about it, but um, it's actually quite serious. So um, you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to risk that. Um, THC less so, you actually have less concerns there uh, of drug interactions. So uh, it's just that high dose CBD that you want to watch out for at this time. Uh, high dose CBD puts me to sleep. <laughs> so <laughs> there, <laughs> that's yeah. what it does to me. Um, yeah. And, and, and uh, uh, how funny, Laura says, hashtag vagina owner. So you, you have a fan here, uh, Chelsea. Yay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll let Chelsea coin that term. Um, this topic, this, this came in I, on our podcast. We talked about, um, uh, cannabis helping with, with, uh, uh, erections, with the mm -hmm. blood flow. Mm -hmm. And this person wrote in and said, actually what they have found high doses of cannabis and heavy use of cannabis, uh, uh, inhibit inhibits. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and so can you talk about that? Cause you were talking about blood flow earlier when I think with, when I, we were talking about the Valerie, uh, the benefits with she and her partner consenting adult adults, and mm -hmm. you said blood flow and I was, and I was bringing it up then, were you talking, is there a lot of blood flow, uh, to women? Uh, yes. Uh, again, the, the tissues are analogous, right? So the effect is actually more or less the same. It's a little bit more muted for people with penises. They don't have quite the intensity, but they're, they're getting the same sensations. You're getting the same physiological response. And the, the reason that high doses of cannabis will uh, inhibit erections, uh, has, it's, it's everything to do with dosage. And also the fact that Cannabis itself, despite that vasodilation effect, is not, it's, it's not Viagra. It, we're not talking about that intense of a blood flow effect. It will not give you an erection, you know? It's, it's subtle, and again, it's more potent for people with vaginas and vulvas, um, but it, it can kind of facilitate and give a little nudge in that direction, but you really do have to pay attention to dosage because the psychological element there is far more potent than the vasodilation effect that, that cannabis has. Um, when you are, sorry, that's my cat. Uh, when, when you are uh, too high or you're higher than you want to be, um, you know, that vasodilation effect is, it pales in comparison to, to what your brain is doing to your body, right? Um, so uh, Dr. Tischler, my, my colleague here, would, would yeah. really harp on this, uh, that, that dosage is so important to, to get right. You have to start slow. You have to go really, really low at the beginning, maybe even like, like barely, barely uh, I, I don't want to say microdosing because that's, that's sub- uh, your, your awareness, but, but just barely awareness uh, of highness uh, is kind of the zone you want to be in. And that is, seems to be the most enhancing. Interestingly, lubes, cannabis topicals for sex, um, have a similar bell curve. So a little bit, especially for people with penises in our research group, what we saw was um, there was a, a smaller and higher response curve. So you get the dosage right and it's helpful, but not enough, nothing happens and too much. And you actually, it actually becomes more difficult to orgasm and more difficult to sustain an erection. So you really have to make sure and get that dosage right. And there was a greater, uh, the, the dose response was, was greater with people with penises in our group. And are they talking via inhalation or oils? Our studies, our study was on topicals. Uh, you know, so, so that specific piece of information and data was, was from that. Yeah. Um, but uh, I imagine it holds true for systemic yeah. as well. Uh, while you're on the topic of your lubes, as hey, Chelsea, um, with your THC lube that you're talking about, you're discussing, can it get me high? And this is a female asking the question. <laughs> uh, I used to answer that question, no, but I now have to be very, very careful about how I answer that question because the, the real answer is yes, if. Um, 
if you are using a topical, a THC topical vaginally and nothing else, the chances of you absorbing enough into your bloodstream to experience a psychoactive high, very, very low. The vagina is not, while it is densely vascularized, it's not designed to absorb things and put them in the bloodstream. But what is designed to absorb things and put them in the bloodstream is your digestive tract. So anything um, orally or anally that, that you, you, any, uh, you know, product that you get in there, you're risking, you're taking a higher risk of experiencing intoxication. Um, likewise, if you use quite a lot or for a long time, you are risking intoxication. Uh, we had, I, should I retell the story? We had a military couple. I don't know if I told this on the podcast. No. Um, I was teaching and I, I said, you know, it's really hard to, to get high this way. It's really unlikely. It's not impossible, but you're talking about like maybe a milligram is floating around in your body, right? Um, and this hand goes up in the back and it's a hetero couple. Uh, the male is in the military and uh, he actually uh, failed a drug test because they had been using a THC lube that they were making themselves three times a day for a month. Oh. It was because he was on leave, right? So they really wanted to live it up. And at first I was like, that's just impressive. <laughs> That's like three times a day for a month. Wow. But at that point, even though each of those instances, they didn't feel high, they had accumulated enough through that use, that very heavy use that uh, he did actually have enough in his bloodstream to, to test positive for THC. So, um, you're getting a little tiny bit in your bloodstream is what's happening. It's really tiny. And the chances of you noticing that are really small and they go up the more that you use and the, and especially if you ingest it. So <laughs> hope my mom's not watching because I'm blushing here. So the same <laughs> question about your, about your lube, it says, well, if I can't get high, can my partner get high if they're eating it? <laughs> yes. Yes, they can. <laughs> and uh, it was, it was, the genders were swapped here. We had a woman in our first test group before we did the, the 50 person group in our first very more casual test group. Um, we had a woman who did a 45 minute blow job on her partner. She really went for it. And um, she did end up getting high because she had ingested enough uh, at that point to, to, she, she felt, you know, not, not like way out there, like too many edibles, but she felt significantly high and she was also not a, a cannabis consumer regularly. So, um, so yeah, it's absolutely <laughs> possible. It is. There's an article out there. Again, I'll get a little, uh, a little frank here because yep. this is just the title of the article, but it's called how I turned my pussy into an edible. And it's about the, that, that exact thing. Um, somebody who, use cannabis lube and then had their, their partner go down on them. And that was, uh, that was, you know, they, they did that intentionally. And I think the article is kind of silly, but, um, but yes, absolutely. And some people really like that and some people don't. And if you don't, then what you do is you want to apply the product, wait 40 minutes, plenty of time for it to absorb. And then just kind of gently with like a water wipe or something like that, just wipe away anything. And at that point, the absorption has happened he's not going to get, he's not going to get high from it. He's not going to get high. Even, yeah. even with the one milligram, like the, like the military. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, the question came in a while ago and, and I, and it was, and, but we continued on on the question. So earlier you were talking about the high doses of CBD with um, Viagra, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the question here is, hi guys, what is considered a high dose of CBD? Um, <clears throat> that is, excuse me, <clears throat> that is, uh, if I had to put a number on it, I would say anything that is upwards of five milligrams per kilogram of body weight is probably what I would say. Um, the most medically active doses that they're looking at right now are 10 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, which is in the neighborhood of like 800 milligrams for a, a uh, 150 pound person. Um, so that's, a, it's a lot. It's something that you would need be needing to do on purpose. Um, if you are taking hundreds 
of milligrams, if you are in the hundreds of milligrams zone uh, with your CBD intake, then uh, that's probably where I would, I would start to pay attention. Perfect for that one. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going down this list here and I know your kitty's probably saying, feed me, feed me. <laughs> um, let me see. And if anybody has questions, I would let you all, we have Ch Chelsea on here. I uh, pretty much went down. We talked about the history of cannabis, um, uh, the escape. Let me see here. Um, dysfunction. You know, thanks for all these questions. I mean, the, the, we had a lot of people and a lot of people even wrote in and said, I'm not able to watch a show. We be re-airing this. And so, yeah, this will be actually be live here. We'll, we'll have this. It stays on Facebook, but we'll also put this in our, in our uh, United Patients Group podcast section, excuse me, no, on, on YouTube, on the YouTube section um, as well. Um, we talked about what's the biggest benefit for a cannabis you can have on, on me and my partner. We did cover that, correct? I think I was yeah. after a valid I, I would think so. question. Yeah, you know, most of the, like, blood flow is the, the physiological effect, the dominant physiological effect, and that decrease in the bad kind of tension, not the yeah. good kind of tension, which is, you know, you intentionally clenching and, and clenching as an arousal response, but like the unconscious tension and tension that can cause painful intercourse. Um, and then the, uh, the, the mental effects, uh, uh -huh. you know, are everything, <clears throat> all that magic the cannabis does. How about give yourself a plug? You know, how can people oh. find you? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I did just start this new venture and uh, is in these, weird times, you know, where I'm parenting and, and running a business at the same time. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely helpful to get as much info out there as possible. Um, so uh, I recently started my own consulting company. It's called Sabara Consulting. That's C-E-B-A-R-A, -A, um, which you can find me at chelseasabara.com, C-H-E-L-S-E-A, C-E-B-A-R-A. -A. And uh, I am consulting with primarily uh, businesses, primarily corporations, especially those who are new to the cannabis space, who haven't formulated with cannabinoids before and need some help with product development and formulation. I can also do marketing, branding, and I did a little bit of uh, content creation also. And then individuals who are interested in not as medical advice, but who are interested in a consultation to just kind of help them navigate the extant cannabis marketplace and choose the best products for them in an informed way, um, how to read a label, what terpenes to look for, how to find a COA, what, you know, what, what products and consumption methods might be most appropriate for their specific concerns. I also offer, offer individual consultations there. Um, and I am looking for work right now. I would love to have more clients, uh, especially, you know, those people who are more novices, uh, but uh, will work with anybody at any level to help refine and perfect your cannabis products. Hey, Amen. Well, well said. Um, Chelsea, thank you. Thank you for, for uh, coming on the show, not only on, on the Facebook Live that we've just uh, done, but also on, the, on, the, uh, on our podcast. Uh, the feedback has been great. If you haven't watched the podcast, um, the topic of that is how can I improve my sex life physically, emotionally, and spiritually? Uh, Chelsea Sabara, thank you so much, as always, for, for being on. And uh, Thanks for helping out. Yeah, a pleasure lot. as always, John. Sure everybody else as well, and uh, we'll see you soon. Uh, again, this is John Malanka with the United Patients Group. Be informed and be well, and uh, have a blessed evening, everyone. And thank you for everyone who made this a date night as well. So date awesome. nights are very important. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, have, thanks, fun. have a good night. Huh? Good night. Sure. Good night, everyone. Bye bye. Hey everybody, John Malanka with United Patients Group. Be informed and be well. This segment is brought to you by Aspen Green. Aspen Green is just a handful of USDA, that's right, USDA certified organic hemp and CBD brands. And all of its hemp is grown from the perfect topography and climate found in Colorado. It is a family owned business and is deeply committed to the science of providing only the purest hemp and CBD products for the best results and most beneficial experience. Its mission is to bring the therapeutic value of pure organic hemp and CBD to people who seek supplemental relief through the use of healthy natural products. 
Aspen Green is free from toxins and runs up to eight different lab tests from bona fide third-party labs throughout its product line. It holds in high regard three foundational principles that guide every aspect of their business, actions, and interactions with their customers, partners, as well as their community. These are quality, integrity, and transparency. These will always remain at the hearts of their efforts to bring their beneficial products to consumers. Check out why purity matters at aspengreen.com and follow them on social channels at Aspen Green CBD. Use promo code UPGCBD for 20% off. Again, UPGCBD for 20% off at aspengreen.com.